The Star Ocean series has been going on for a long time now, with the original released on the Super Famicom all the way back in 1996. And while the series has seen its ups and downs, the series did establish itself as a favourite among JRPG fans of the 90s and 2000s. Entry into the series is easy, as each Star Ocean game can be easily played as a standalone title. With that said, it may be worthwhile playing through them all, as they are all set in the same universe and have minor references references to one another. So, while these stories are not directly connected, the series does have many staples that are present in all or most of the games. These are the things that make Star Ocean, Star Ocean. The things that give the series its own unique identity. Before we get into it, if you like this video, hit that like button and sub for more Star Ocean and RPG content coming soon. Also, let me know if I missed any important staples in the comments below. Alright, let's get into it. Let's talk about the setting. Star Ocean games have always had loads of sci-fi elements within, and this is perhaps most obvious in the multi-planet exploration and space travel. The majority of each game, with the exception of Star Ocean 4, is located on a single planet, with other locations eventually opening up. In Star Ocean 1, we had the planet of Roak, then Expel in Star Ocean 2, Elecor 2 in Star Ocean 3, Faycreed in Star Ocean 5, and Aster 4 in Star Ocean 6. In all of these instances, these planets are underdeveloped, giving rise to a medieval versus technology theme. Now, Star Ocean 4 is the odd one out here, with many explorable planets and locations throughout the game, but most of which are also underdeveloped. This mix of sci-fi and fantasy is crucial to the series. Having a game with an entirely futuristic, techy setting would not feel very Star Ocean-y at all. Private actions or PAs are a recurring feature in the Star Ocean series. They refer to usually entirely optional scenes between your party that will trigger in different situations such as being in a certain location at the right time. Viewing PAs will not only give further insight into each character but it will also adjust their affinity level, often leading to extra endings. Now, the way that PAs are activated do differ in each game, but something that remains consistent is that viewing them all is very difficult without a guide. Star Ocean 2, for instance, has over 80 endings, which are based on your affinity with your party. Private actions have been a staple of the Star Ocean series since day one, and it doesn't look like this is going to change anytime soon. Our next Star Ocean staple is item creation, and this is a huge focus in every game in the series. Item creation allows you to create and enhance loads of items using many different creation techniques, such as blacksmithing, cooking, compounding, and alchemy. Aside from Star Ocean 1 and 2, which features the same mechanics, each other installment has its own unique flair in creating these items. Star Ocean 3, for instance, allows you to recruit inventors from all over the world to help develop develop new inventions. One thing to note, however, is that most of these systems are very guide dependent. Unless you want to spend hundreds of hours experimenting and repeating, chances are you won't be creating the best gear. The mechanics of item creation is one thing, but this staple just wouldn't be the same without Welch Vineyard. Lover or hater, this cheerful inventor is always around to put a smile on your face or make you cringe. I got the best idea. You need to sneak into the Imperial Capital. Huh? What? You gotta bust in there and knock some sense into somebody. The Emperor, whoever. While her first appearance was actually in Star Ocean 3, she was later added to the first Departure and Second Evolution remakes on PSP. So, how is it that this lively character is in every single installment, despite them being so many years apart? Well, if you've played the entire series, you'd be able to take a pretty good guess, but I'm not going to spoil it here. While on the topic of recurring characters, we also have Ruddle Crispin, who is always getting himself lost and requires your party to help him out. Then there's the prankster Puffy, who appears in every game in some sort of side quest. 
Again, not much is known about her, but it's a safe bet that you'll encounter her in all future installments. Another staple of the series is the Kenny family, who make appearances in all of the games except for Star Ocean 3. These characters all play different roles in their respective games, however they all have some military associations such as Ronix being the captain of a Federation ship and Steven being commander of the Moon Base. These characters also have a middle initial which makes them easy to identify. My grandfather taught me how to shoot, and my grandmother instructed me in close quarters combat. Wake up everyone! This is crazy! What's happened to you all? I don't want to be a hero. All I want is to perform my duty faithfully and see justice enacted. Something that the Star Ocean series excels in is its post-game optional content. Personally, I much prefer end-game content as when I see the credits roll, that's all folks. But I do know that a lot of you love how much post-game content this series has. We are talking multiple optional dungeons, overpowered super bosses, and even extra difficulty levels if certain in-game conditions are met. The Ethereal Queen and Gabrielle Celesta are two such super bosses that appear in every game except for the first. Fun fact, they also appear in many other Trias games such as Valkyrie Profile and Radiata Stories. If you want to dig into an RPG with loads of post-game optional content, then you should know that the Star Ocean series has you covered. Now, this one is a little bit different since it only really applies to Star Ocean 1, 2 and 3. I am talking about optional party members. These three games have quite the roster, but you will not be able to recruit all of them in a single playthrough. For instance, if you choose to recruit CS at the start of Star Ocean 1, you won't be able to team up with Ashley or Eris later in the game. For this reason, multiple playthroughs are recommended if you intend to experience the game with every character. The party members in Star Ocean 4 and 5 all joined as part of the story, but at least Star Ocean 6 featured two optional characters that could be recruited depending on which path you choose. I really hope Star Ocean goes back to its roots in the future with more optional characters that aren't all obtainable in a single playthrough. Now, we've got to talk about some of the staples of the combat system. Each game has its own form of action combat, allowing you to run around the battlefield with one character and switch to others on the fly if needed. Your party members will also have their own unique special arts or battle skills which are often equipable as short or long ranged. The key concept of Star Ocean's combat is finding moves that combo well with each other, enabling you to dish out maximum damage. Then we have Star Ocean's magic spells, which are called Symbology, or Signaturgy in Star Ocean 5, or Semiomancy in Star Ocean 6, just because they want to be different. The key here is that unlike special arts, only a select few characters in each game can cast these spells. It's usually useful to have at least one of these characters in your party for healing or AoE damage. Battle bonuses also play a role in all of the Star Ocean games since 3. These mechanics all work differently, but they all provide bonuses in battle, such as increasing the amount of EXP you earn. Now, these systems have had their ups and downs, but if you ask me, it was at its best in Star Ocean 4 with its bonus board. Wherever the series goes from here in terms of its combat, you can be sure that it will be action focused and full of skills, combos and symbology, or whatever names these magical spells may be. Finally, it wouldn't be a Star Ocean game without a little bit of fun. Every game in the Star Ocean series features a battle arena or mini games in one form or another. Star Ocean 1 starts things off simple with a battle arena. Star Ocean 2 takes things to an entirely new level with Fun City. With a name like that, it's gotta be fun, right? Well, it has a cooking contest, its own battle arena, plus it introduces bunny racing to the series. Star Ocean 3 also features a city dedicated to fun, but this time it's called Gemity. Here we also have a battle arena and bunny racing, but this time there's a runic chess minigame too. Star Ocean 4 allows a player to return to the Star Ocean 1 battle arena, but this time it also has bunny racing. And Star Ocean 5, it has nothing. To be fair, it does have cathedrals, which are arena-like optional areas scattered around the world, providing an extra challenge, but Star Ocean 5 definitely went downhill in this area. 
Most recently, Star Ocean 6 introduced a unique board game called Isoa. Here, you can collect pieces, personalize your own deck, and climb the ranks by challenging others throughout the world. But the main question is, was Star Ocean 4 the last we'll ever see of bunny races? Surely an interactive racing minigame not unlike Chocobo Racing will be next, right? Only time will tell. And there we go. Those are the staples of the Star Ocean series. Those are the things that make the Star Ocean series so unique, but they also act as a blueprint as to what we can expect in the future. What did you think of this list? Did I miss anything important? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, make sure you hit like and sub for more JRPG and Star Ocean content coming soon. I'll be releasing a Star Ocean ranking video next, so stay tuned for that. See you next time.